I, I should start by saying that I normally don't talk about my paintings. When people ask about them, I explain that the painting is simply whatever it means to them. And that I, I can only ruin it by talking about it. Let's just sort of start at the top, typical interview questions. You were uh, born in Torrance, California, but you grew up in Oklahoma, right? Mm -hmm. The Grapes of Wrath in reverse. What's that, Grapes of Wrath? Well, my mother was a Dust Bowl Oki who went to California uh -huh. and for a number of reasons came back to Oklahoma. And so I was raised in Oklahoma rather than the place I was born. Huh, interesting. So what was it like growing up as Kathleen Jardine? Jardine was my fifth surname. I told you that, right? Wow. Yeah. My mother, um, she married four men before I was seven. Two, two of those marriages were in advanced pregnancy. So this is the 50s, like, you know, 1960. And it was so stigmatic, she, there was nothing she could do but get up and move every time she broke another convention. Wow. Yeah. So I lived in 11 houses before I was seven. Went a trailer in six, and 10 houses. <laughs> I was taken home from the hospital to a trailer park that overlooked the Pacific. And I'm sure there are castles on that property now. Wow. So is there any like childhood memories that really like stand out to you in a positive or negative way or? Um, I, I had the most brutal childhood of anybody I know. And it, making paintings probably saved my life. When people try to kill you, you, I think often the victim just goes ahead and finishes their work for them. You know, it, it is, so extremely confusing and depressing to be beaten to death in childhood. And I grew up with that. And the, my, I didn't have anybody to go to. There, there was no help. And that was partly because my mother strategically kept moving. And so I, you know, I changed schools, changed teachers, and there was no one to turn to to ask for help. I didn't know. I didn't know to go for help. But I had the natural world, and I was raised at a time when people really didn't know where their kids were or what they were doing. And I was out tearing around on horseback and, you know, jumping from seven, seven foot banks into the river on my horse bareback, swimming to the next county. So my childhood was magnificent and terrifying. It gave me a lot of material to work with. I imagine so. I think for a lot of us, to some degree, our childhoods are a mixture of like trauma and th the best part of our lives. Yeah. Do you think, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, abuse in your childhood. Is that something that still, you think still affects you to this day? Oh, or? yeah. Yeah. I don't think people get over that. Um, it, it, it just became a, a constant in my life that I was stigmatized as a woman by being that worthless, you know, yeah. it, it was, um, I, I just must have a, a big resilience factor genetically, you know, it's genetic if you're resilient. My siblings weren't, they all became meth addicts and life in prison without parole for one and prison for for the other and now the next generation a niece in prison nephew in prison so the resilience that i had it kept me out of jail <laughs> yeah um how many siblings do you have by the way three are they all your sisters or you have a brother or? i i have two brothers one is indigent and homeless and you, uh, unhelpable mm -hmm. and the other brother is life in prison and he and I are very close 
and my sister, uh, I'm very close to both of them, they, they both, um, I, I was the benign influence in their lives, which of course I didn't realize growing up, but I was the safe harbor. I was the adult, and I was drafted very early to adult tasks, like getting dinner on the table every night from, I started when I was eight. I had to go to the grocery store and plan my menus. You know, I had, I learned to cook, keep house, iron. Um, and I had, I was very proud of being able to do all that, but that made me the, the least malignant older person in the house. Right. So it really seems like you're the one who sort of broke the, the chain. I did. I wish I could have taken my, my little brothers and sister with me, but I, I wasn't big enough. I couldn't do it. Right. So I want to ask, uh, you know, as all this is happening, you're painting already. I began, um, it, I, I remember when, when I was three, I had this little sketch for a long time. I wish I still had it, but I drew my mother naked in high heels walking a poodle. That's kind of, there's a current of that through my work. Um, identifiable at age three, you could tell it was my mother, and breast and pubic hair, which I had observed. You know, my mother was relaxed about being naked, so I knew what women wow. looked like. <laughs> yeah, and I was compelled. It's I think to paint your whole life, you have to be, uh, you have to have some compulsion disorder. And I was compelled. I just couldn't not do it. It saved me. Well, I think a lot of artists can really like relate to that sort of their art saving them. Do you, especially for me, because I, I'm a musician, as you know, and I remember there were a lot of years where I did music just sort of casually, but then there was a point where it sort of consumed me and sort of became my life. So do you remember that point when your art sort of consumed you? And what Absolutely, kind of, yeah. What kind of art were you making during that time? Yeah. I brought my baby home from the hospital, and I couldn't quit looking at him. And it was the beginning of making a living because people bought those little watercolors of him. Every day I'd put him down for a nap, and I'd make a little watercolor of him. And they just... I sold him for like 125 bucks. Wow. But it was... It was a big start to my painting career. And because I'm a natural portraitist, I began getting commissions and I started making money. Um, I w I've never been supported by anybody. That's unusual for an artist. They have Definitely. family income or a spouse, something. Mm -hmm. So that actually sort of leads into my next question. Do you remember like the one painting that really, you, you sold that painting and then you're like, okay, this is what I'm doing for a living. You know, that moment where you, you made your big break. I feel like every artist has one. Do you remember what that was like and, and what that painting was? Mm -hmm. um, but my son's pediatrician was my friend and she came to the house with her little black bag for his first exam. So he was a week old or something. And she bought the first of my paintings so she walked in, wrote a check for like 250 bucks, and walked out with two paintings. And I thought, I wonder if I could keep this up. I was 27. I'd sold a few things. Uh, what year was this, by the way? Do you remember? 80, uh, 1980. So the dollar was actually worth more. So that 250 was probably worth like, what, 500 today? I don't, I don't know. Uh, Something a lot like that, more. probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, who were some of your influences when it comes to... I was just telling you before we started that uh, Zizlaw Bekczynski is one of my favorite artists now, and uh, he makes nightmares sort of stuff. And uh, it's really scary at first, but once you get past your judgments, you're able to really admire the mastery in it. And I feel like a lot of his art speaks to me some, in some weird way and fascinates me. Do you have any artists who like, affect you in that way, maybe alive or, or dead? Yeah, they're all dead. <laughs> I think that's the case with most artists, like the greatest are just all dead already. Well, painting is dead. Yeah. It is. Well, I think it's changed forms. You know, it used to be on canvases like the ones that you've got here and the one behind you, but now it's a lot more digital than before. Yeah, you know about that. I don't know mm -hmm. about that. But um, photography and film just meant 
the end of painting being important culturally. I, the, in the workshops that I've given and in when I've had to give um, talks, I tell people that painting is dead and that I can prove it to them. And I ask them to, um, to name five films, name five actors, and some other questions like that. And I say, no, these, are, these have to be people who do not live in your community. Everybody can name five or ten. And I say, name five living artists who do not live in your community. And these are often artists and art teachers, and they, they can't name a contemporary artist who doesn't live in their community. Wow. So are all your like influences, are they people that you know, knew personally or? My influences are Vermeer, the last case. They are people who looked, looked at things with this burning gaze that they had to, to they had to transmit somehow to two dimensions. And it's the looking that is, that is meaningful to me that they sat and looked at these people or imagined. They didn't have photographic references. They did not, they were not photorealists. They did not trace a projected photo and color it in, which is, most of realism now is about that. They, they never sat and looked. And Ken has asked me, what, what, what are the people in my paintings, what are they doing? I said, they're modeling. He said, what do you mean? I explained, they are letting me look at them for hour after hour after hour. And I can't tell you how grateful I am to just be able to look at them and make some kind of transcription. So I'm entirely classical in that way because that was the only way to work until 1880 or 90 or something. So speaking of... You, the, the state of art do you do you have any ideas about the state of modern art do you have any opinions on like how yeah, where art is today it's completely motivated by novelty and shock value that but everything in the culture is it's all about novelty today and i'm not i'm not interested in that i don't want to make anything on the basis that no one else made it i'm not motivated that's interesting because uh, Beksinski, his art is very shocking. And I'll show you some photos of it before I leave. And so you think that most people are going towards this shock value That's our when it culture. comes to art. Yeah. What's new? What's new? What's new? What's new? What's new? Right. That was last week. Let's have what's new huh. now. And I didn't right. have a television for most of my life. So I, I have not been able to keep up with the fact that people watch that and that it informs them and when I go to a hotel I watch TV to see what's happening and the emphasis on novelty is relentless on television what what can be gotten past the censors you're right yeah that that tends to sort of permeate every industry and that includes music as well which has changed radically over the years well that is boring to me Novelty for its own sake is not a good idea, I don't think. I mean, it, it's okay, but it is part of what makes art irrelevant is that it's engaging the same thing as making a commercial. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to your art, do you, have you like, because um, you went to art school, right? You're, you're professionally trained. I, I was, um, I had made a living with my work for about 15 years when I decided to get an MFA here in Chapel Hill and there was no one on the faculty who was in any way interested in what I was interested in. Everybody, uh, they, you had people coming in with new shock, new shocks, like a, a faculty member was hired and her work were pantyhose clipped to uh, hangers with sand in the feet and rolled in grease or something oh, and then wow. covered in hair. The, her work was all related to things like that. 
Huh. Inter- and what, what were you interested in whenever you were in college? I was interested in becoming a better painter, but I went to the wrong place. There were um, a number of, um, what are they called, uh, expressionists. Uh, and they had gone out of style and were really pissed about it. And they were older men and had bad attitudes to women. They were they were pissed off to start with. And so it, it was not a good experience for me going to grad school. But you, you went through with it anyway and you just... I made it. Sort yeah, of I barely it made it. They had a faculty meeting after one of the, those guys asked me how much I made a year. And they decided to throw me out. Wow. None of them made that much money ever <laughs> well, <laughs> from the yeah. sale of their work. I feel like people want the traditional stuff. Because of so much novelty is here, we want, a lot of people really want that sort of classical style. And they're willing to pay a lot more for it than they are for just a novelty. Do you believe that when it comes to university, that uh, it has taken, you know, because a lot of people go to university just to get a job. Whereas very little people go to university to actually because they're interested in what they want to get a degree in. Uh, do you have anything to say about that at all based off your own experience? Well, I could have tried harder to find out what I was about to get into it, because Greensboro has a great painting department in which people are actually in the, mat, in, uh, the MFA program. There's real solidarity or there was at that time when I got my degree. There, there was such solidarity in the student body that, it, or the grad students, that at one point the, they decided to extend their whole education by a year, all the kids, wow. or all the young people. I, I could have gotten myself to Greensboro, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so do you still use any of the techniques and stuff that you learned in college, or are you just... I didn't learn them by, I, I learned by reading books, and I went to a workshop by a guy named Daniel Green, and I learned in a day and a half how to make a classical painting, how to lay down a neutral ground, how to uh, uh, fix the values in the painting. Uh, These are all figurative paintings his stuff was. He's a really good painter. Um, And it just was so helpful. I learned color mixing for flesh tones. I didn't have anybody to ask. So I, I was really lucky, at least I found somebody who could teach me some basics. I was a watercolor painter until I went to grad school and I was trying to transition, transition to oils mm-hmm. and could not get any basic help from any of the painters there. Wow. I, I was hired later just to teach classical drawing and painting at UNC. I, I only taught three classes, but um, Dennis Saborowski argued for hiring me so they'd have somebody who could teach kids who wanted to make something look like it actually looked. Oh, wow. <laughs> they couldn't, none of them could do it. There was not one person who could teach perspective on, wow. the, on the faculty. And so I was in a big collision with the art world just getting, getting an MFA because they all represented the... Um, establishment. I think that it's genetic in me. My paternal uncle was a successful painter. I never met him, but I've seen a lot of his work. And my father and uncle's grandfather fought for Bismarck. What's Bismarck? Bismarck was, um, this is Europe. 18 whatever 90 or something. Oh, is this a war you're talking about? What? Like a war? Yeah. Oh, okay, Uh, I see. see. uh, I've forgotten which war it was. Australia, Hungarian, something. Anyway, um, he, he was a spy. He went through the courts of Europe and looked at people, memorized them, left and drew them. And people were assassinated by his drawings. I've actually heard about that. Really? Oh, yeah, you told From, me. Yeah. yeah. I remember you telling me that. Yeah. That's fascinating. Now, I don't know that it's true, but I was told that by my father. I've only met him three times. So. That would be an awesome legacy to have if it were true. Yeah. Even if it wasn't, I mean, just having that story floating around about you is kind of cool, yeah. I think. So we've talked a little bit about your technique when it comes to your art. 
most artists, they um, eventually at some point, they make a painting which encapsulates all of their mastery in one painting. So all the techniques are mastered at one painting. And this is known as the masterpiece. Do you have that in the works? Have you thought about it at all or like making your own masterpiece? I don't see these paintings as being separate. They're all part of the context of one another and of the culture. So I, I can't claim to have made a masterpiece that's all in the eye of the beholder. I and can see that, I, yeah. I don't feel that I have much control at all over what I do. That's it. That's actually, that leads perfectly into my next question because I feel the same way when it comes to my own creative process where it's mostly just me getting out of the way and letting the creativity happen. So I don't really feel as if my work is really mine. And so it's, it's funny to hear that you sort of think that same way. Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts on creativity that you've experienced through your career? I would, I would describe it as taking dictation from some source that I don't know or understand. And it makes me happy to do that, to feel that flow through me. Yeah, I, I feel the same way about my own kind of stuff. Do you feel as if all human beings are tapping into the same creativity or we all have different creativities that we're sort of tapping into? We are all products of culture. I'm, you know, I'm an amateur sociologist. I didn't know that. <laughs> well, amateur, very amateur. Um, I, I see us all as being very much, very much alike. Mm -hmm. Human beings are much more alike than they are different. And we, are, the ways that we are alike are produced by culture. Right. So, um, I just want to, because we're talking about culture, where do you think your art sort of fits in today's culture? Does it have anything to do with it? Do you think it has any place in today's culture? I think it's important. I think what I do is important, maybe not today, but in the future. I definitely think, yeah, and I feel that same way about my own art. It might not matter today, but, you know, 10 years or 20 years down the line, this stuff is, might be future yeah. classic type stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. My, my question is Montagna's question how to live, what is the right way to live? Mm -hmm. And that I am channeling with somebody or something in making these paintings. These, these are paintings about um, a kind of a classical way to live. What do you think is the best way to live? Well, for me, the best way to live is to be to be able to make things. I'm, I'm not a hanger-outer, I'm a maker of things. And if I'm not making paintings, I make other things like houses, gardens. Uh, for me, home is not some place to get away from. You know, home, home is some place to restore you. And I think that my paintings show that. They, my paintings say, go home. That's interesting. That's actually, that's really fascinating, actually. So that actually sort of works because I want to segue into sort of away from paintings and into your other professions. You were an interior designer. You've made this beautiful house. Did you yeah, build this? Yeah, I'm not an interior designer, though. Did you build this yourself? Or? Yeah, but that's, uh, I, I'm, um, I, I draw blueprints for houses. Oh, where I have, okay. And have helped build them right. in the beginning. Um, there was a period where my time got kind of split half and half between developing this this company, Sun Garden Houses, for my husband at that time. Um, I designed and he built, but I had to help build, too, in the beginning, because we had to figure out how to make all these parts come together. Right. So the reason I asked if you were an interior designer, because it's so nice in here. And it's, it's cozy. And I see your yard out there. You, you've got this huge garden. You planted all this stuff yourself. So I'm, I, I assume it's safe to say you know quite a bit about a lot of areas of creativity, really, mm -hmm. not just painting. Um, so, do, do you know, did we talk about future shock? Do you know that? No, no. You can mention it now. What, what is it? Um, what's the guy's name who wrote it? it oh, it's a book? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
he he says that people will become progressively more addled as the rate and pace of change accelerates. And that's what we're seeing. People are losing it just because all of the eternal verities are in play. Um, my, my idea was to make a refuge that was had much less change, much less I'm blowing this tea. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you mean like novelty or um, that are classic? Classic means what we keep from generation to generation, right? The, not antiques, you know. We're it, to be classical is not to collect antiques. It's to try to accumulate and hold together the things that made life worth living for people. In the past, and if you've, you know, if you have, um, if you come up unloved and almost obliterated by the people who were in charge of caring for you, you really, you can't, it's very difficult to parse the question, what is the meaning of life? Right. Why does nobody love me? Mm -hmm. You know, and to try to make something rich you you have to look to the past to see what worked for people in the past. There, there are some things that did not work at all. Right. <laughs> we have plenty of examples of those. Yeah, the Greeks and Romans really took care of um, equality mm -hmm. between men and women. They, you know, we we have it's been two thousand years or longer, probably closer to three, that women have been just dogs and we're crawling out of that as hard and fast as we can yeah how do you feel about that in today's society do you still think there's some remnants of that left or do you think that women are f truly free often it has seemed to me when i see tv that the feminist movement came down to um the right to fuck whoever we wanted to, just like men. Right. And it seems to me that it just kind of frittered away this huge, this this material, you know, on just that one feature. Those were the women I knew who described themselves as feminist. I, I describe myself as a feminist more in terms of, um, Ken, Ken has referred to me as an earth mother type. And I, I see the thing that was abandoned by, by feminists. They wanted to go into the, the conventional work world dominated by men. Well, I didn't want anything to do with that. They can have that. I wanted to be left alone and make enough money to, to keep, keep <laughs> doing what I was doing. Right. Yeah, I, don't, I really don't blame you. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, you mentioned earlier something about the meaning of life. What do you think the meaning of life is? I don't have a good answer for that. I don't think a lot of people do. <laughs> it's to, to do no harm first. They're, the rules are themselves the meaning of life. So as I was walking in on this sort of topic, I saw that you have like a little bit of an altar over here by the door with some some pictures and stuff like that. It seems sort of spiritual. So I was wondering, oh, yeah. are you a spiritual person or are you religious or? Would you say that Buddhists are spiritual people? I think so. Yeah. Um, do you, What are your beliefs about reality or your ideas about reality, if you have any? Well, we talked about mental illness of separating from your body, of separating from reality, watching from some confusing distance. And right. I, I still have a problem with that. And you're referring to a conversation that we had off camera, by the way. Yeah. Just so anybody. So. I think that reality is in play all the time. And we think we're in charge because we, because things cooperate with us for some period, you know, we, and we, we feel that we are somewhat in control. We have agency. But it's just a short fluke. 
for most of us. I really, I resonate with that. I feel like that's, that's true, yeah, in a lot of ways. Especially like looking over the history of mankind. It's where things are really working for us and then all of a sudden they're really not. Right. You know? Right. Um, the, human beings are social creatures. And the, the ideal, of course, is that we can learn to deeply love someone Maybe not all people. I'm certainly not capable of loving all people, but it, it is our social reality that we, I don't, the individual is, of course, helplessly lost in all of this, but we are, we are all still completely part of it. You have to be a hermit to escape that, and there aren't very many yeah. hermits. I, I, I feel that. We have to get along with people. We have to accept one another's flaws. We have to make as little of other people's flaws as possible in order to be happy. Right. And I, I would say that being happy is our responsibility. If you're going to be born, that's kind of the contract. <laughs> yeah. Come into existence. Nobody cares if you're happy. Yeah, it's really They irrelevant. really don't. So you may as well be. Since nobody cares, mm -hmm. just do it. Yeah. And it's, it would seem like the default state for life is suffering. So it's like, yeah, you might as well figure yeah. out how to get happy here because suffering's yeah. the default. When you realize how much people are suffering, when that really comes over you as a young person, it is it flattens you. It my my horse died recently. You know, I had her for 21 years. She was fundamental to me. And it made me really think about the two billion people on this planet who have so much worse problems. They don't have a country. Right. They can't get enough to eat. You know, their children die just as if it were still 1500 or something. They, you know, high infant m m mortality. Um, it, those people, all of those suffering people, they sort of gird me somehow. I feel, I feel responsible to remember them. I have no reason to be miserable or unhappy when you look at what so many brave people face. Mm -hmm. And we do sort of live in a bubble uh, in America. This is really a bubble where we should be spending all of our time trying to figure out, get to the highest truth that we can while we're in this bubble and we have the ability to sit and think and to have a day off and not get shot at or eaten by wild animals. Yeah. But it seems like a lot of people sort of just throw that away. Are there any life lessons that you've learned over the course of your life that you would want to pass down to someone who like maybe, the son? Yeah. Who's maybe watching this video or your son or what would you say? I would say observe yourself, understand yourself, forgive yourself. That's powerful. Yeah. yeah. Live, live with it. And of course, meditation is the entry for that, that position. Right. You, know, you observe yourself when you sit zazen. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else to do. That's true. I, I, I resonate with that because a lot of my life is this process of just observing because you know, I live at a Zen center, so that's pretty much all I do. I hope you're going to keep this up. Do you think you'll stay? I think so, yeah. Oh, I do hope you I do. I think so. If, if they don't kick me out, I'll stay. <laughs> I don't think they're going to kick you out. I think everybody's thrilled to have you here. I think so. Um, I want to ask you just a few more questions before we end. Uh, do you have any regrets? Like just, it doesn't have to be about art or anything, just in your life in general. Do you have any regrets? Uh, is there, sure. Uh, if you, if you want to mention them, it's okay. If not, I totally get it. Um, well, I wish I had understood more in the beginning about men. What do you mean? Well, I, I didn't understand that men were fundamentally different than me. I'm what you might call a romantic. And all, all of my passionate feelings for men have been like, they've, they've manifested as devotion, loyalty. But I don't know that men are able to recipro reciprocate that very often. Men like novelty. Most men like novelty. The ones that I have have um, let in my life, they 
they like novelty. Marriage and family are fundamentally in conflict with their natural inclinations. And I wish I had understood that better when I was young. I didn't get it. I see. I think for a lot of us, like not knowing, just having, just being young and sort of dumb sort of creates a lot of regret. And you're, you're probably right when it comes to that. And I'm sure there's like a, I'm sure there's some evolutionary reason behind it. Oh, there is. That's you probably know that, the case. Though. I don't know. Um, it could really? it could just be that you know we've always we've always had to go out and you know hunt the woolly mammoth and look for the next thing to feed our families to to bring back, and so we got in our minds this idea of always chasing novelty. So I'm sure there's some truth to that actually. Well, males have millions of sperm, and they are able to you know replicate themselves genetically. Right. by sowing their seed widely. Mm-hmm. Women are able to get a child to the age of reproduction by sticking with one man in those in that or those kids. It's just it's biological imperative that makes us different. And that that would have helped me a lot if I'd understood that. That makes early sense. On. Yeah, that that really makes sense. Because um you know my emphasis on asking what is a home, how does a home work, what does it do for people. It would have been good to have understood that a solid marriage is a good thing if you're going to emphasize living in a home. Yeah, it seems like the idea of marriage is sort of going away in modern society. People aren't really down for that anymore. What are your thoughts on that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, when life was, when life expectancy was age 35, it wasn't a problem then. You could get children to sexual maturity yeah. before you died. And now that life expectancy is almost 80, people have a really hard time figuring out how to stay with one person for maybe 60 or 70 years. Wow. And I know people who've done it and have done it really well, but there aren't very many of them. You know, that's a perspective I never even considered when it comes to this that the life expectancy has changed and that we're just around longer. So we, we sort of get tired of the same old person. Well, and when you don't, when you're not combining forces to raise children, then you become two individuals. And what, what is it that you have together without children? You right. know, you have to look at that. Um, I, I was going to say that ch- children raised in homes without fathers, you know, the fathers don't support them. They don't yep. come see them. That is a recipe for sociopathy. Every uh, Everything that can go wrong, the statistics just go sky high. Children in fatherless homes go to jail. They're drug addicts. They kill themselves. Uh, they're criminals. It just goes on and on. So what are we going to do? We, are we going to just raise children without men? You know, I, I've known men who had, I, I knew a guy who had seven kids from six different women and didn't support any of them. He was wow. my garbage man. <laughs> well, I mean, the job seems suiting. He was good looking. I understood. I understood how they, they got into it with him. But right. In, anyway, um, I'm very concerned about the future, as I hope just about everybody is. We, we are coming in for problems that Americans are not well, they're not ready for, (laughs) you know, it, the breakdown of society in this country, we are so spoiled. We are entitled. We expect things to stay stable and work pretty well. And we're going to have a hard time if that really starts coming unglued with climate change and whatever else. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people in America seem to think that the way that we have it in this bubble here called America is just the way that reality is and that it couldn't be any other way. We talked a little bit about novelty in this interview, and I wonder on the topic of fatherless children, do you think that... Culture is changing. And if you don't have a mother either which was my case, the statistics for child for uh, motherless children all over the world, it increases mortality in childhood 
by by a hundred percent. Just to have your mother absent or dead, your chances of dying in childhood go up twice. Wow. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, like evolutionary wise and just life wise, it makes total sense how that would be how that would be the case. Yeah. If if you go to Europe, also you see there are many fewer children in public spaces because their birth rate plummeted. It's weird to be in a country where you don't see children around yeah, in cities. So. Right. I, Italy it was was a shock that way. So we're going to have many fewer children, I'm sure. I mean that trend is in motion. So um, I'm actually going to, we're going to close out the interview here. Is there anything else that you would like to, to say or to talk about before we end the interview? I anything just, that I might have missed? I would like to say that it's very important to not dedicate your life to consumerism. I think that's a point a lot of us need to hear. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there is another book I'd like to mention called Your Money or Your Life. And it's... Uh, little set of directions for how to save enough money early that you can quit work. You learn how to live on very little. And that was my life recipe when I was young. It worked, you know. I, I would say that many people are discovering something like that now because of the plague. Right. Yeah, it's a lot of people are starting to work for themselves now. They're saying, you know, F the man, I'm going to do what I want to do type thing. Yeah. I think it's inspiring. And I think that if you, when you start working for yourself, it, in the beginning, it's about a job, but over time it becomes a self-development process because you realize that you're the boss and the employee. Yeah. So if you want to get better results, you have to be better. And so I think that that yeah. leads to people being better people, which you, means the society gets better. So I think this is a net positive. I agree. And that you're right. That consumerism sort of mindset is uh it's really holding us back not just as a country but as a whole of humanity in my opinion so uh i think we're going to end it here uh i hope i didn't miss any important questions i oh, wrote i wrote most of this down so. i can go on and on so <laughs> but that's only because i'm talking to you you, you think so I, oh yeah you and i have many common elements and so it's it's easy to talk with you when I went to college, I never met anybody like us again. I do think that, you know, uh, creative people are like truly creative people who are like living off of it and doing their own thing off of it are quite rare. Um, a lot of people are sort of in between. They're like one foot in society, the other foot in their creative work. Mm -hmm. I do think that it's very rare to find someone who is sort of both feet in all the way. Yeah. So, uh, this was a great interview, though. I really enjoyed talking to you. So this is the end of the official interview. I do have several minutes of just, you know, other talking that we did after this point that I'm going to play in just a second. But I did want to say, Kathleen, thank you so much for allowing me to come on and talk to you and to see your artwork and to explore your home. It was an incredible experience, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So thank you so much for allowing me to do that, and I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Sure. Try to set up. The same way. How much time do you have to dedicate to this? I can't imagine. Um, I'm doing it right now. I'm trying to do it twice a month. Just really like low frequency because I find that uh, it's really difficult for me to think about stuff to say. I don't talk a whole lot. So trying to talk. This is why I'm interviewing people because I try to do a channel with just me talking and I don't talk that much. So I don't really, it didn't work. But. Well, you speak well when you do talk, and maybe it's because you, you're not a blabbermouth like some people. <laughs> maybe you're right. I like being alone, and then when I'm with people, suddenly I'm really into being with people, and I want to talk with Oh, so you're like a, a you're, you're sort of like me. I'm an, um, an extroverted introvert. So I prefer to be alone, but when I'm with people, I can talk. Yeah. But I have like a social battery. There's a certain point where I just... I can't talk anymore. Yeah, I'll start I'm, feeling I'm physically upset. I need to go make something or read. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, hey, I'm in that same sort of thing too. Where if I don't create, it's very difficult for me to be in a good mood. Did Did I say anything about to you earlier about the importance of reading in my life? 
You didn't mention it, but if you'd like to mention it now, the camera and everything's still okay. rolling. Well, so. uh, through, um, through a curious turn of events, five sets of encyclopedias wound up in my 12th home. I could tell that story, but I'll skip it. And I just sat down and read them. And it's, I mean, I didn't read straight through, I flipped. But I read the encyclopedia right up to my SAT test. I, or, and I got out of high school a year early. And it's because I was a reader. I became interested in um, liberal arts. Liberal means, means generous, the word liberal. And it all came together for me in painting. They, they have a lot of, his, my paintings have a lot of historical references. Um, I just, I don't know what it's like to not be a reader. How I, many books do you think you've read or across your life, if you could just guess? I don't know. My, my first many? husband is a doctor. Uh, he was a classicist. A and what? I, yeah, he was, um, he, got a, he got a degree in classics. Oh, it's okay. called Letters I see. when we were in college. And I read his books. And I just kept going. You know, I've, I've read many, if not all, of what are considered classics. Do you have and, a top five? Like top five books I, that you've I would read? start with Homer. <laughs> yeah, Homer was, of course, the first written um, story. I didn't that, know that. That we have, yeah, about 2,500 years ago. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to look that up after this. Okay. I didn't know that even existed. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it was interesting to me, too. I couldn't believe that, right. he, that that's the oldest thing of its kind that we still have. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I could go on and on about a top five Tolstoy. Is there any other books that you would uh, like definitely recommend to anybody watching this who might be interested in reading something cool? Too many. I mentioned two that are both kind yeah, of sociological. We have those, I'm going to put those in the description so that people watching this can just go down and click the link as well for that. Um, I, I'm really into reading. I like to read things that are difficult, that are challenging. Is it just nonfiction or do you read fiction as well? I like fiction too, but I don't find very much of it that I like. I'm the same way, sort of, yeah. I read mostly spiritual stuff. Not really any fiction or anything. I, I like the canon. We have a canon for a reason. What those people wrote thousands of years ago, it's still grippingly important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Pliny, Plutarch. Um, I can go on and on. I have to go in there and look in the... Right. In, and I do think that you're right, that these uh, stories that mankind has been passing down for thousands of years do appear to be some sort of archetype which represents something within our psyche, our psyche that we really connect with. Right. And that explains something ab about reality that we intuit on a fundamental I, level. I started reading, a, a, I guess you would call it critique of Homer, and it was about the invention of mind, which the Greeks invented. They didn't at that time, they did not realize what the brain was for. They thought it was for making snot. Oh, wow. I'm not kidding. That's cool. Yeah, they weren't sure where our thoughts and everything came from, but they thought probably in, in the chest, maybe the heart. Yeah, the Chinese and uh, Eastern con countries seem to think the same way, too. Mm -hmm. So the individual was very different than it is today. We, people thought of themselves collectively in a way that we don't so often today. You're accused of being in a cult if you do that, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, this is funny because this is something I've been talking about recently, how there is no right worldview. And if you look throughout time, all these human beings, they saw the world a different way. And to them, it was 100% true. Like to the Greeks, they thought snot came from the brain. So that's what it was for them. That's how reality appeared for them. They, they believed that their lives were steered by the gods and that very few things were actually to anybody's credit as having done them themselves. They felt that all the turns in their lives were dictated by the gods. Christianity picked that right up and went with it. Right. It seems, though, uh, society today seems to be sort of a mass 
delusion, a mass hallucination where we're all sort of thinking in the same way. And the ones who sort of fall out of society, they're called cults. And But in, I think in reality, there is no right way to see the world at all. Do you feel that same way? Yeah. Well, I think I think we have some clues and we can gently apply ourselves to the clues as, as I use that word, which produced all my paintings. Right. And I think I've had, you could say that I at least have not done much harm. You could say that of me. I think that's valuable. It It is. Yeah. It is. I watch people pick fights with one another over nothing all the time. Right, yeah, as if you they know, have nothing better to do. Than yeah, just pick fights. Like, like it's dynamic and desirable mm -hmm. and to have an opinion on everything, to have a list of people you like and, a and then one of people you dislike. It, that seems to me to often be an adult preoccupation to develop their list and then they deploy that in social settings. Those become the topics. I, I don't, I think I'm very different f from my mother and her fourth husband, but we're still more alike. He, he was obviously a psychopath, but we're still more alike than different. Yeah, I feel the same way. My, my, my pops was not a psychopath, but I feel the same way about my dad. I'm mad different than he is, but at the same time, I'm also a lot of the same. Yeah. It's kind of creepy in a way how similar I am to him. Mm -hmm. You know, on the topic of uh, worldviews and sort of people being angry and, and mean to each other, um, one thing that really strikes me is that what we call physical reality, despite everyone having different worldviews, that appears to be the we same. We agree, yes. So that seems to be this place that we sit right now is the unifier, this yes. what I call physical reality. I'm so reality. glad you said that. Yeah. That That's very insightful for you to pick that out because that's the problem I It's the... Um, matter is the thing I have trouble with. I don't just effortlessly, smoothly join in what you're describing, where everybody agrees that physical reality is fundamentally the same. Mm -hmm. It seems to be without context, without, it seems to be free of any worldview. Yes. So I sort of wonder, can you see it just as it is? I mean, that's why I do so much meditation. I wonder, is there a way to see no worldview? I think traveling is going to be so good for yeah. you. I think so. I think it'll be fun. <laughs> Have you been to Mexico? I haven't. I want to go, though, because I love Mexico. Go see the third world. Yeah, I, I, I don't just want to go see the nice places. I definitely want to see some of the yeah, get out the, the country. in the world and yeah. stuff, too. I haven't... I, it's been over 40 years since I've been there, but it, it, you know, I thought I had a third world childhood and I did comparatively mm -hmm. in the United States, but then I went there. Yeah. And it's, I imagine it was not as third world as you might have yeah. thought. It, the population was young. People didn't live to be as old as they do here. We can, we can wrap this up. Oh no, that's cool. I was just looking at the, I was just looking at the camera and making sure that we're not running out of like time on that. So I don't want you to get like cut off in the middle of what you're saying. Well, I don't care. So I'm totally listening. So you if I'm plenty, looking away, that's... Yeah, you have plenty to work with. Yeah, honestly, I think uh, even up to this point, a, a, a lot of this stuff I might put in like a... In sort of like once the camera stopped rolling, this is sort of what... Yeah. Place, I yeah. Think, this is totally awesome. I feel like a total success because I only got to have one child and he loves me. It means the world to me that I was actually able to bring somebody into, into being who, who loves his mother mm -hmm. and doesn't feel like I just fucked him up, you know? Right. Is that who's in this painting? Uh, this is Will. I'm going to get a little closer. Okay. So that we can this see. Will, and what is this painting? Is this oil or? Yeah, it's oil. Uh, let's see. Let me get over here because the the light's sort of glaring through. That's a little. That's, yeah, this is way better. Okay, so. This is called cousins. With the, uh, let's see, cousins, with the cat and her infant opossum. 
and what what this is about. It, you know, if you know the backstory on things, I don't know that it improves the painting for you, but um, my I think I told you my is is this still being recorded? Yeah, on the camera. Okay, my uh, grandmother prostituted, my niece prostituted, and. This is Justice, one of three children conceived in prostitution by my niece. And oh. she, she was taken by her brother and adopted and given a chance at a, a more conventionally happy life. So you've got, the, these two people represent two very different focuses on the family and on, on the family and then on uh, parenting. Right. And the, um, these, these dolls are, they were made by a woman who was in the lunatic asylum in my college town. Mm -hmm. And she made hundreds of them. And she, I had a friend who worked there and she was able to get me a pair of them. Their names are Dottie and Nutso also. You're talking about these two? These two. Can I go get them and I'll just hold them? Yeah, I noticed just... that you actually had one over here, like a little doll. On the... Yeah, that doll uh, is in many of my paintings, and it's one of the few things I have from childhood. Um, on the back of it, on, behind, on the neck, it says, You Need a Doll Company. And huh. in 1963, I was 10. If a cat can raise a possum, which happened in, in my home, What's wrong with us? Good question. We can't even <laughs> raise another human being. You're right. You know? Just be too fucked up and crazy and self-absorbed to just raise another human being. Here are the dolls. Oh, so you actually have the physical ones. Dottie and Nutso also. And this little baby doesn't really have a name. <laughs> wow, they look exactly the same. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, this light. I have a big party called Versonage. Ah. Classically, <laughs> that is what was done. Interesting. So, what about this one? Who's this in this painting? This um, one's harder to see because it's covered in glass, it looks like. Yeah, I, bet. I wonder if you can get that at all. I like can that. get it. It's showing up. There's just some, uh, some reflection, but it's showing up there. Well, we'll take a little photograph of some of the things. Painting. This was a present oh. from my son when he was, um, I think, 14. We went to New York and he found these in some little shop. I'm not sure. I'm trying to get it on camera, but you can see that these little collection, these little things are actually here in person. Interesting. I don't have everything. Like, I don't have this collie. You know, I, some of them I wish I had. Get a little closer to this so I can see it. There we go. And I have these, I brought these back from the Chartres Cathedral, which was, had quite an impact on me. What's that, the Chartres? It's in, in France. It was, oh. It, you know, it took them, I think, 200 years to build that. So that means like eight to ten generations cooperated in making this incredible structure. Hmm. It, I can't wait for you to see Chartres. Chartres. I can't say it right. Now this painting is freaking huge. Would you mind standing in front of this one? Sure. I think that so I can get a good a size. This can thing you is get me? massive. I think it's ten and a half by five and a half. Wow. And still not finished. I've got a lot of other little things to put in it. Wow, this one's come such a long way. I've, I've seen it several times that I've come here. Yeah, you watched it develop. This is called Baby's, Baby Says Bye Bye to the Holocene. The Holocene is the last 12,000 years. We are now in the Anthropocene. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. There's a child in this photo here. Yeah, that's Will. It's just a little picture of my son. And I did that. I did use a snapshot on that, but it's mostly from imagination. And what are you using? Because this paint seems to have sort of a texture to it. That yeah. It's not on your other paintings. Well, this, this is called a painting knife. And if you load it up and drag it, <laughs> that's oh. what you get. So you got a lot of gear here. What's your go-to stuff, if you don't mind just showing? Oh, I don't know. 
uh, your go-to well, kind of... Because, and we have the light in the floor, which is sort of weird. Yeah. It's got this red vibe, which is sort of making it seem a little evil. Well, I'm, I make painting medium. Okay. And... Uh, oh, and what brands do you use? Do you use like a certain brand of paint? I or? use anything. Okay, it doesn't I, matter. I mean, we could go through all the paint that I've got down there. Oh, there's and a bunch of stuff here. I got I'm just going to get a, like a little image here. A bunch of these are Natalie's. Let me find them. And these brushes, how long have you had them? Oh my god. You all you use the same ones for many years? Or? Yeah. Yeah. I should find I should find this before. Let's see if we can find. Sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was a bad move. <laughs> I'm looking for anything new in here that you can get an idea of what they look like. But this is not new, but this is what happens to your brushes over time. This was probably about that long. They get worn down to this shape that becomes very precious to painters. And you can't make it. You can't manufacture that. You have to make it by painting. To oh. get this, this uh, I don't know what you call it. It's got that. sort of like a sharpness to it, huh? Yeah. I guess that's good for good for lines. Um, you have to make lines. By the way, do you paint with shapes, or do you do you line draw it off first? Or? Well, this in this painting, I just um, laid down a black ground, same as in this, and oh. just started pulling it out. I can see her on the side of the black that you're yeah. talking about that you started with. I started just pulling features out of it. And I'd been to Joyce Kilmer. Mm -hmm. The trees are like seven feet, eight feet across. Right. And I just remembered them. I, I didn't have any photographs to, to look at. But that's uh, these are tulip poplars, and they are the climax tree. Hmm. It, if you uh, do what I did, make a horse pasture out there, mm -hmm and then abandon it, it will, if you leave it alone, it will completely predictably produce tulip poplars and a couple of kinds of oaks and hickories. Interesting. And it starts out with poison ivy and blackberries and is working its way through making... Um, Smaller paintings here, mm -hmm. which are... I do that for fun. I change scale. These are sort of like your practice paintings or... What, what was that? These are your, like practice paintings? No, no, I wanted to make them, but I wanted to make them small. I, I've gone through periods where I've made a lot of little bitty paintings, and then I go back to great big paintings that I normally am working on something that's a whole world. You know, this is a whole world. This is like being in this room. This is like looking through a window. Oh, I see what you mean. Wow, you're really good at capturing the vibe. I don't think you can get these watercolors, but there are four in this series. They're all related, and they're all Samana and Taylor. When they lived next door, they moved in into my house for I don't know how long, eight years, something. Oh, wow. I couldn't get them out. So I put them to work. I paid them to work for me, to model. <laughs> how long did she lay there on that rock to get this one? Um, she was good. She... Laid there long enough for me to draw her anyway. Am I in the way? No, um, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> you're not in the way yet. I'm going to get that one next, but I think you're just low enough for me to be able to get it without you having to move. So I'm just going to sort of stand back here. You're going to do the little paintings of me in there? The wow. little naked paintings of you. This is actually a beautiful painting. Thank you. That's my Who are these two? My goddaughter and her best friend. And they, they look a lot alike in this one. Well, they're both very pretty girls, so they kind of look alike because of that, I guess. These are these. This is this floor here, huh? What What was that? This is the rug that I'm standing near, right? Um, it's made up. Oh, because it, it matches it, a lot yeah, of these does, similar. I don't think I did. I have that. Yeah, th this did start out being like that rug, and uh, I. I can't remember how I arrived at not being literal, but right. I just started playing freestyling. Yeah, that's from when you were three years old. Yeah.
Wow. It, you know, to keep up with anything like this, when you live in a peripatetic family... Peripatetic, it, what does that mean? It, moving around. Oh. And I, I have just a few things. I have my grandmother's plate silverware, mm -hmm. and that little jacket, and a, a few other little things. They're very dear to me because poor families who move around a lot, they don't have heirlooms. They don't. Not real, not real like actual like money valuable ones at least. Most of them are just sentimental value. This is beautiful. waterfall and the color in front they might you might be able to get a good photo of that a lot of these are just volunteers a lot of the flowers that grow just come back every year Horses alone. Yeah. And he seems to be doing okay. I thought I was going to have to give him away. I love him. You know, I don't want to. Babu, what are you doing? Okay, now you don't want to get this this part right here. You want to get over here. We're oh. not looking at that. Okay. Come here, my sweetie. Come here, my baby. <laughs> he eats a lot of the apples. He and he and Zuzu ate the apples. <laughs> 